wengi wanasema kumbukumbu yako au legacy yako yatakuwa mazingira au na mabarabara hiyo ni kweli lakini zaidi ni kupatia wananchi au wenye nchi wa Kenya uhuru wa kweli I first met the president at the Lancaster High School when he was uh, Tom Boyer's parliamentary secretary when he came to talk about session of paper number 10 I think it was a very a very professorial presentation on session of paper number 10 which which we really appreciated so we always regarded him as students as one of those icons of of uh, in parliament uh, brilliant suave very articulate he delivered his talks opening addresses keynote addresses uh, from his head for me that was very impressive very 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 impressive towards the end of the 1950s a young man named Mwai Kibaki from Kenya started his public service as an assistant lecturer at the economics department of Makerere University Soon he moved back home and took up the position of the first executive officer of the Kenya African National Union KANU at the age of 30. He was elected to parliament in 1963 to represent the then Donholm constituency now Makadara. From that point, Mwai Kibaki never looked back and has dedicated his entire working life to public service. His story is symbolic in many ways. The conclusion of his 50 years in public service coincides with Kenya's own existence as an independent country for the last 50 years. It provides a good opportunity to take stock of his contribution as a leader among others to this great nation. On the 24th of January 2012, President Mwai Kibaki took a nostalgic trip back to Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda's capital to get bestowed with the prestigious honorary doctor of laws honoris causa of Makerere University it was conferred on president Mwai Kibaki in a colorful ceremony which was graced by president Yoweri Museveni of Uganda and presided over by the chancellor of Makerere University professor Mondo Kangonyera by virtue of the authority entrusted to me i confer upon you the honorary degree of doctor of laws honoris causa of Makerere University congratulations your excellency Kibaki excelled with distinction at all levels of education at Makerere where he graduated with a first class honors degree in economics and the London School of Economics where he set the record of being the first Kenyan to be awarded a first class honors degree in economics and public finance Many of my leadership skills we are developed and nurtured here. <laughs> Now, 52 years after my departure from Makerere, I reflect with gratitude on my long career starting here as an academic continued into politics and public service in Kenya and culminated in my election by the people of Kenya as their president by any standards Moi Kibaki has had a distinguished career in public service he became the you can say the founding executive officer of Kano which was formed in February 1960 from that time you can appreciate that kibaki had become a national asset and been an assistant minister and then he came minister for finance the last days of president jomo kenyatta had been vice president he joined the reform movement at the end of the 1980s or uh, an amendment of the constitution to reduce the powers of the presidency he had been leader of the opposition so that by 2002 he was the 
single common presidential candidate. President Kibaki came to power on a popular vote after networking with his peers for a long period of time. An injured President Kibaki took his oath in a wheelchair. His spirit and optimism never faded. Mimi Mwai Kibaki Na hapa kwamba Nitakuwa muaminifu Wajamuhuri ya Kenya The mood was emotional and urgent. Kenyans were keen to move on as much time had been lost over the 40 or so years since independence. In his maiden speech, President Kibaki vowed to make Kenya a prosperous and working nation. He rallied all Kenyans to play a role in this noble task. Now, all of us, both young and old, men and women, Kenyans of every group, every race, every creed, have embarked on a journey to a promising future with unshakable determination and faith in both. Kenya was the new constituency President Kibaki had yearned to serve. As he took his oath of office, he understood what the people wanted and he knew that he had what it takes to deliver their cherished dreams. It was possible to give Kenyan children a healthy life, a decent education, a rewarding job and dignified home. It was possible to give Kenyan women proper and safe motherhood, access to financial support, whatever their station in life. It was possible to help Juakali artisans access cheap credit so that they too could build their dreams. It was possible to build better infrastructure so that Kenyans could move their produce efficiently to the markets. It was possible to build new cities which would absorb the highly educated Kenyan workforce and share in the global pie rather than watch dejectedly from the sidelines. It was possible to give each young entrepreneur an opportunity in the global ICT industry and an opportunity to become prosperous right here at home. Above all, it was possible to achieve a new Kenya, where people are rewarded for the work they arduously performed. Upon entering office, President Kibaki's National Rainbow Coalition administration found Kenya's economic growth at its lowest ever. Kenya's growth, hampered by poor infrastructure, a general lack of direction and political apathy, had slumped to less than 0.6%. The country was on its knees as far as economic and social development were concerned. Early in his presidency, President Kibaki also faced several heart-wrenching moments when several government ministers, members of parliament, died in air accidents. Perhaps the biggest blow came when he lost his deputy and friend, the Honorable Michael Kijano Amalwa. The path to reform started in 2003 with the launch of the five-year economic recovery strategy for wealth creation and employment. We wanted to expand the democratic space and institutionalize good governance in this country. The reforms touched virtually every aspect of public life. And that is your economic recovery strategy for wealth and employment. Led by President Kibaki, the National Rainbow Coalition government's economic recovery strategy produced the most sustained period of growth for all key economic sectors in the country's history. When I joined the ministry, way back in 2005. Um, the first thing I was told um, was that Kibaki believes in planning. Once the economic reform strategy reached a conclusion on how to move forward, several other strategies were put in place in order to allow the implementation of the lofty goals set by this conference. 
During this same period of rapid economic growth in 2005, work started on a strategy that would transform Kenya into a globally competitive, rapidly industrializing middle-income nation by 2030. We started saying, after five years of the ARS, where do we go? So we started a discussion on Vision 2030. And indeed, we also established the National Economic and Social Council, which really was a body that was consultative uh, and advisory to the government. This brought a very unique gathering together that had rarely had regular meetings before. Cabinet ministers, private sector leadership, academia, international experts in growth and national development. The vision was agreed by the council uh, that it should be what we are now calling the overarching vision uh, 2030, that Kenya will be a globally competitive and prosperous country, offering a high quality of life to all citizens. The first five years of that strategy worked reasonably well. In fact, in certain respects, especially economically, remarkably well. We moved from about 0.2% very anemic growth to 7.1% in 2007. I believe the president has laid the foundation uh, that uh, will make achievement of uh, Vision 2030 irreversible. The second thing he did was to create a framework in terms of a vision that articulates what is it that we need to do so as to achieve our dream. And that is what is called the Vision 2030 blueprint. And now Vision 2030, like uh, session of paper number 10 of 1965, is the blueprint that will govern the economy of this country until 2030. One of the first issues President Kipaki addressed was access to free and compulsory primary education. I'm glad we had a government that was supporting education so fully. Don't forget that since independence, Kenyans had been very interested in education, so much so that even during the colonial times, some communities had established their own schools. The cost of education in Kenya had been identified as a great hindrance to access for many children. There was the, the issue of preference of boys when parents had to make a choice, then invariably they chose boys to go to school and not the girls. A stakeholders conference drafted the new education strategy that was premised on a sector-wide approach. The country has over the years made significant strides in the development of education sector which has recorded rapid expansion from primary level up to the university level with a corresponding increase in enrollments. Tunahitaji katika Kenya nzima watoto wasome wote. Sio tu primary. Primary siku hizi ni kitu kidogo. Primary hapana masomo. Hiyo ni mwanzo tu mtoto anaanza kusoma primary basi. Hiyo wewe hapa ulipokuwa bado kusoma ulifikiri mtu akisoma primary amesoma hapana hiyo ni kazi ya mtoto anasaidiwa asome hiyo just uh, of course masomo yanaanza wakati ameingia high school i remember saitoti and i coming to state house to say the half of the year is gone money is spent it was spent in fact, during the elections, what do we do about it? You looked me straight in the eye and told me, David, I've made you Minister for Finance. Go and look for the money. By the time the first group of uh, primary school graduates were finishing school, already the government had started a program on subsidized secondary education. With the introduction of subsidized secondary education in 2009, enrollment has risen to 1.3 million in 2011, up from 700,000 in 2006. The fact that he, he allowed the universities to run as academic institutions, having been a lecturer himself, perhaps is the single most important thing that has uh, led us to 
uh, increased numbers. There are currently seven public universities with 15 constituent colleges and 33 private universities, eight of which are fully chartered. These university colleges are spread all over Kenya. He has also taken into account the marginalized areas which had been forgotten before. Universities and higher education in general cannot um, excel and uh, go far without research. It's really the key, the key component of higher education. And the president uh, knows this. And uh, one way that he has uh, supported this is the support the government has given to the, to the National uh, Council for Science and Technology. They have been given more money uh, and as a result, we are, we are able to see more publications uh, you know, among the lecturers. We are, we are able to see more um, funded research proposals. And, and this is what is going to drive higher education and hence the economy. In order to finance these projects, there was need for increased revenue. President Kibaki's years as finance minister and one of Africa's top economists helped him demystify the relationship between taxation and prudent use of tax revenues in economic development. Indeed, among the important economic transformation President Kibaki will be remembered for is the weaning of Kenya from dependence on foreign aid. A lot of people, a lot of institutions who are not paying taxes. And in fact, it is one area where uh, President Kibaki can be very proud that he kept asking, where does our tax money go to? Kuna jambo moja limetokea. Sasa zamani zile tulikuwa kodi mliokuwa mwatoa. Ilikuwa kodi kidogo. Kidogo. Pesa ilikuwa kiasi kidogo. Sasa tumezingatia nyinyi mpaka mtoe kodi jia sawa sawa. Na diyo sasa tuweze kuelimisha na kuwapatia kuwa mambo haya mengine. Yote. Na yule ambaya na mali. Na tumempatia mali. Na hataki kulipa kodi. Huyo uzimuone huruma. Tutafuata yeye mpaka mwisho. His government achieved this first by growing the economy. The country's GDP has tripled in the last eight years. This made it possible to widen the taxable collections by reforming the institutions charged with this responsibility. The Kenya government still has dependable development partners working with it in areas where it may not have the resources or expertise. However, it has taken charge of its economic destiny by avoiding unnecessary foreign aid. President Kibaki's administration places the concerns of Kenyan youth at the heart of its development agenda. 60% of Kenyans are youth. And if we are going to develop, that is a body that we must develop. Women Enterprise Development Fund was introduced in the 2007-2008 financial year to provide support to women entrepreneurs. Tumeweka tayari pesa ile ya kusaidia kina mama kufanya biashara yao vizuri na kufanya kazi yao nzuri zile wanataka na pesa hizo zitakuwa nyingi kama zile tuliletea akina youth In the water sector, the government has reformed the management of water and sanitation services. Today, 65% of the Kenyan people have access to piped water, compared to 38% 10 years ago. Major efforts have also been made in water conservation. The major water towers are being rehabilitated and future generations are assured of this valuable resource. Tree cover has improved from 2% to 6% in 2012.
The housing sector has seen immense growth during President Kibaki's tenure. Affordable housing for Kenyans has therefore been one of the government's key focus areas. For the first time in over 30 years, civil servants are beneficiaries of homes which they own. The National Housing Corporation continues to develop homes for the low and middle income groups in the country in order to bridge the housing deficit. One of his administration's major concerns over the last 10 years is the upgrading of slums, a project the government is undertaking in the major slums of Nairobi. Several private real estate firms are engaged in the development of commercial and residential properties, yielding the biggest building boom since the country's independence. Kenya's Vision 2030 clearly defines the new framework and policy directions towards achieving a food secure and prosperous nation. Agriculture is the backbone of our economy. The sector contributes about 30% of the gross domestic product and a further 27% through linkages with other sectors. The agricultural sector has the greatest impact on overall economic performance. Since independence, agriculture sector has never grown as fast as it has grown during Kabaki's time. To grow from negative three to plus 6.4, that is a leap of nearly 9.4 percent. We are the number one tea exporter in the world. We are number one flower exporter in the world. You would like to see everybody practice farming as a business. You would like to see us move away completely from thinking of agriculture as a subsistence enterprise to a commercial, uh, uh, economically viable business. A lot of money was uh, pumped into KCC Eldoret, around 110 million. We revived a big dryer that is doing 100,000 liters of milk every day. And that gave the farmers a lot of hope a lot of uh, future, even the youth are now so much involved in the dairy industry. Kazi ya metufanyia kwa upande wa maziwa ni mzuri. Tunaona tunalipa mzuri, tuna wakati imejelewa, kuna mwezi imeruka kwa mwezi ngine, na tunaona ni vraa, sauri tunaweza kupanga. Innovation has always played a role in Kenya. The country is today home of some of the world's most important ICT innovations. It's going to have a big impact uh, in terms of uh, improving productivity in every sector, from agriculture to healthcare to education. Um, in healthcare, for example, we are working on digitizing practically every record. Um, every patient record. What this happens is that soon we would improve the processes in all hospitals and cut the cost. We estimate we can cut up to 40% of the cost of the healthcare cost, meaning we can now plow back to uh, ensuring that every Kenyan has um, insurance or any, every Kenyan can access uh, healthcare. This is what IT can do. Kenyan internet users have grown from 2 million five years ago to 15 million today. John Waiboshi, the CEO and founder of the Virtual City Group of Companies, is one of Kenya's emerging IT entrepreneurs. He is the winner of the $1 million 2010 Nokia Growth Economy Challenge. If you look at the environment for us in the ICT sector in the last 10 years compared to the previous 10 years, it's almost unimaginable what the difference is. And a lot of that has to do with the infrastructure that was, that was put in place. Whether you're talking about the fiber cables or you're talking about the telcos, uh, uh, mobile networks uh, going all the way beyond the cities into the rural areas, that infrastructure has enabled us to be able to set up our businesses and offer services in the market. His winning application is now changing the lives of thousands of tea farmers all over Kenya. The iHub is a place that many startup incubators and information technologies have emerged. In the past uh, three or four years, all the uh, awards, uh, million dollar wins, have come to Kenya because uh, we have uh, given access to technology. And the kids now and the youth are developing these new applications 
which have changed the world. M-Pesa is a worldwide brand now. Statistics show that 4 billion shillings passes across mobile money platforms in Kenya daily. Konza, a completely new city being built on 5,000 acres and is due to be complete by 2018. Konza is a great opportunity for businesses and investors. Konza offers probably the best location to do business in Africa and will be one of the most sought after international commercial investment opportunities served by excellent communications and the best ICT infrastructure in Kenya. Na ile hapa Konza ambao mmeshaelezwa wengine hamuamini lakini hamuamini namna gani na watu ambao wako America na Europa na pengine wanaamini na mtu anakuja na ndege anachukua kiwanja huko ili ajenge factory yake. Anajua mahali hapa itakuwa ndio mahali pa kujengwa viwanda ambavyo vitatumikia East Africa, Africa yote hii. Shirikisho la Afrika. Wote tumechangamuka. Shirikisho la Afrika. Wote tumechangamuka. President Kibaki's commitment to the growth of the East African community has been steadfast. The East African community's five governments, that's Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda, agreed on a protocol providing for the free movement of labor, goods, capital, and services. Already, the East African Community Customs Union, which is the starting point for the integration process, is in place. In November 2012, he was present to witness the opening of the East African Community Secretariat. In the health sector, the government continues to enhance health services. Investment in the sector includes expansion of the health infrastructure, modernizing of technology, and rationalizing systems such as digitizing medical records, provision of free medicines for tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and distributing over 20 million mosquito nets. The government is also working on a health program that will ensure every Kenyan has access to free health care. At least the killer's application has to be a health center. a dispensary HIV AIDS transmission rates have declined, and the government has facilitated the provision of antiretroviral drugs. Ten years ago, only 10,000 Kenyans had access to life-saving ARV drugs, compared to the current 500,000. Great leadership inspires, galvanizes, creates, uplifts, and transforms. Leadership is passion, the capacity to ride the highs and lows. Leadership is knowledge, to understand what's required and provide options that are tangible. What you measure a leader with is a capacity to, to inspire. That when you meet this leader, does he inspire you or does he make you perspire? So do you leave his office you know, hurt, even if you went with a document that possibly didn't meet the standard? But you know, the president who, he will inspire you, he will influence your thinking, he will guide you as to what to do, uh, he will never shout at you, uh, he will never you know, you know, castigate you, he will correct you, and let you, you know, give you the reason why you should do it the way he thinks it should be done. Life in Kenya today presents plenty of challenges and opportunities for its citizens. Going to school, getting a job, marrying, setting up and furnishing a home, educating the children. And as the pace of life creeps along, we all worry about how to prepare for old age. We all have aspirations. Each of us yearns for an environment in which we can pursue dreams and grasp opportunities when they arise. President Kibaki perceived this early in his presidency and has worked towards ensuring that all Kenyans get a better deal. <laughs> Mama Lucy Kibaki has played the role of mother of the nation, traveling through rural Kenya, listening, empathizing, encouraging, and acting on issues affecting women and children and communities. Kazi yangu ni kuokoa wasichana wale wanafukuzwa kwa ukuta kama hao ili waelimike kama wafurana. Mizizi ya elimu ni michungu lakini matuda yake ni matamu.
The foundation to move Kenya into a middle-income country by 2030 has been firmly laid. In the current 1.45 trillion shilling budget, President Kibaki's government has set aside 123.6 billion shillings for roads and another 79.9 billion shillings for energy. The issue of infrastructure, even within Vision 2030, it's quite clear that it's a cross-cutting foundational issue that is, creates now the foundation for the economy to begin to develop. And so his focus on infrastructure was actually right on track in the sense that it is a foundation where other aspects of development can now kick in. Public transport in and around the Nairobi metropolitan region has been characterized by congestion, accidents and delays with the country losing up to 50 million shillings daily. There was need to rethink and create a viable option. The mass transit system comprises of bus rapid transport and light rail. The implementation of the mass transit system has started with the development of the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport Siokimau City Centre Light Rail Line. This project is about changing that, transforming that. And so with the other stations coming around, around the city of Nairobi, more and more citizens will be able to access rail transport, providing them with an alternative that is, in my view, most, more cost-effective and time-effective comfortable, safe, and reliable. On 13th of November 2012, President Kibaki launched the Nairobi commuter rail services and opened the Siokimau railway station. This is a crucial Kenya Vision 2030 flagship project. Development of similar commuter railway services in the coast and lake regions is at planning stage. The rehabilitation of the existing meter gauge railway by the concessionaire Rift Valley Railways is ongoing. The government is also in the process of developing a standard gauge railway from Mombasa to Nairobi and onwards to Malaba with a branch line to Kisumu. The economic growth of any country is largely influenced by the status of its road infrastructure. Construction of the Dongo Kundu bypass in Mombasa will ease congestion between Mombasa and the south coast by creating a free flowing traffic link to this economically important tourist destination and the Kuala region. Thika Superhighway, the 10 lane 50 km stretch of road from Nairobi to Thika, is one of Kenya Vision 2030's flagship projects. This road links the main commercial centers of Isiolo, Marsabit, Muyale, and Mandera to Nairobi. Thika Road was a game changer in this ministry and I believe for this government. It is the first big project that was conceived in this ministry, designed and implemented and completed within, within four years. It was a transformational project. People can see what it means to have a good road from Nairobi to Mombasa. That you can drive your car knowing that your car will arrive in Nairobi without any damage. When the road from uh, Isiro to Merire was opened, when they saw the first tarmac, they were kissing the tarmac and crying. In fact, when the president launched the, the, the construction of the Masabit Turbi, some of the people who spoke during the opening were so emotional that they, they nearly shed tears. Yeye kama ni mia nitapatia 100% because ya liwacha manana yake yote kwa akatumikia wa Kenya kuwasaitia barabara, ma district karibu, ma dispensaries, ma health centers. Iyo tumeona kama yeye mwenyewe anastahili kama ingelikuwa ni wese yangu. Since independence, Kenya's urban development took place close to its only railway line and main trunk road from the sea. 70% of the country was therefore marginalized and left out of its development. The Lapset project, in as far as Kenya is concerned, has a major uh, objective being the opening up 
of a hitherto marginalized area and introducing social and economic activity in that particular area. To do this, however, it was, I think, important to try and identify synergies with our neighbors and to have seen that groundbreaking happen earlier this year in which he brought in not just Kenya, but his neighbors, the Ethiopian Prime Minister, the late Mele Zenawi, the South Sudan President, uh, President Salva Kiir Mahardit, to jointly start the LAPSET project. I think we'll see in the next 5, 10, 15 years a significant and dramatic change in what was hitherto marginalized, a marginalized part of this country. Once the project is fully operational, it will open Kenya's second gateway to the Eastern African and Great Lakes region, establish a reliable access to the sea for northeastern parts of Kenya, South Sudan and Ethiopia. The role of the railways is actually to provide that efficient connection from the port of Lamu all the way until Moyale, Addis Ababa, and then crossing into South Sudan. And in fact, that railway is intended to form a land bridge, finally, across Africa, from Lamu all the way until the western coast of Africa. LAPSET is a critical project because its completion, its logical conclusion, by the connection of the two oceans, Indian and Atlantic, by the land bridge, will result now in placing us right dead center in the middle of global trade and increase that. And what does that mean? Jobs and all the socioeconomic uh, development that this country, this region, and Africa needs. This will, when completed, reshape international shipping, international trade. Once we complete Lamu port, ships will be able to discharge cargo at the port of Lamu. And in a few days, using standard gauge fast trains, we will be able to get that cargo to Douala port and all the way to the US. Work on Terminal 4 at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport is at an advanced stage and is due for completion by August 2013 at a total cost of 9.3 billion Kenya shillings. Landing ya nini ya 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 ndege iko upgrading of the Kisumu Airport to an international airport was launched in September 2008. This project entailed the extension of the existing runway, taxiway, and construction of an apron, new terminal building, and associated facilities. We could not imagine uh, that uh, we could have such a wonderful airport in Kisumu. You see, tuko kamo waraia tunajua tu hiyo ni nini ya kibaki, maendeleo ya kibaki. Energy is one of the key important catalysts of economic growth. In order to achieve the goal set in the Kenya Vision 2030 strategy, the development and expansion of the energy sector is therefore critical. Small business people engage in wealth generating activities, children get the opportunity to study with clean energy, rural health facilities provide better healthcare services, industries operate at more cost effective levels, and homes turn into places where dreams are built and enjoyed. The nationwide grid expansion through the Rural Electrification Authority has been consistent and efficient, taking electricity to the remotest parts of the country. Rural areas, mali ustima zinge weza kuingia. Wakati itu naongea, mtu ni ukosa na kosa pesa za kuingiza, lakini ustima zimeingia mbaka mashi. Kule rural areas. Kenya's national power grid is now 115 megawatts richer, following the completion of the electricity generation plant at Kipevo in Mombasa. The Olkaria project will be the largest geothermal power plant in Africa. The Lake Turkana Wind Power Project, located near Lake Turkana, will add an additional 30% to Kenya's current total installed power. Kenya is on the verge of joining the League of Oil Producing Countries. In March 2012, the United Kingdom oil explorer Tallow Oil PLC found substantial oil deposits in Turkana County at a, well, at a well named Ngamia 1. There have also been discoveries of natural gas in the Lamu Basin. These discoveries will ease the current fuel inflation that has thrived as a result of a huge oil import bill.
Kenyan people look forward to the forecasted leaps and bounds towards enjoying life in a middle-income economy. In 2008, the country faced the most trying moments in its history, a close election that led to unexpected violence and a scarred nation. A disorganized electoral commission and immediate misunderstandings that followed the election drove the country to its lowest levels since independence. In spite of the difficulties experienced, Kenya as a nation and its leaders were determined to move forward. On February 28, 2008, President Kibaki and Prime Minister Raila Odinga signed the National Accord, bringing the long-drawn stalemate to an end and putting the country back onto the road to harmony and prosperity. The positive growth path continues as a result of a consistent drive on the part of the government to deliver the Kenya Vision 2030 objectives and also as a result of the hard-working citizens keen to see their country flourish. He has been the central figure, the central inspiration of whatever we have achieved in the last 10 years under his presidency. Let him pray for us so that whoever succeed uh, follows his shoes. The struggle for constitutional reforms had its roots in the desire to correct the deficiencies in the governance framework of the country. Mr. Kibaki had told Kenyans that he was going to give them a constitution. We would get a new constitution on his watch. He was not going to go back on his word. The process began afresh and now we had the committee of experts. Unlike the bombers um, uh, 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 grouping, this was now a grouping of experts. Again, it's a lot of pressure, particularly from the church, saying that we needed to slow down the process of the referendum so that some issues uh, could be resolved. Uh, and he said that moment could not be lost because once we lost it, there was no guarantee that you'd ever regain that moment. So his personal leadership uh, really is what gave us the constitution. Uhuru Park, Nairobi on August 27th, 2010. A special day for all Kenyans, wherever they were. Those who could make it to Uhuru Park were elated. They were here to witness why Kibaki, Kenya's third president, received the new constitution of Kenya following 20 years of failed attempts at constitutional reform. The new constitution gives us renewed optimism about our country and its future. This new beginning must mark the end of shallow political partisanship and herald the start of mature competition among political parties. In presenting the new constitution to the country, President Kibaki appreciated the cultural mix of people that make up Kenya noting that Kenya was a land of many and various peoples bound together by one flag and that its diversity was its strength. Kenya would always be multi-ethnic and multi-racial, he noted, and every individual's rights and privileges as a citizen would be respected and protected. We all know the constitution which we have today is one which has totally transformed the architecture 
of the Kenyan nation and the people are, actually is people's constitution. He facilitated that process uh, which he uh, accomplished with, uh, in, I would say, with distinction. Under President Kibaki's tenure, the Kenya judiciary has undergone a radical overhaul. I, William Nyoki Mutunga, Chief Justice of Kenya, do swear in the name of the Almighty God to deal with the as a result, public trust and confidence in the Kenyan judiciary is at an all-time high. One of the most important things that the president has achieved is just uh, doing away uh, with state-accommodated or endorsed uh, corruption. Corruption may not have gone down the way uh, we all want, uh, mostly because of the weaknesses of various institutions that are supposed to enforce the law. of uh, expanding the democratic space, it is across the board. It is not just in political terms. We have got about 65 political parties, but it's not about that. It is on every sphere of our development. Gone are the days when uh, journalism students could not express their views. Gone are the days when journalists themselves cannot express the situation on the ground. But right now anyone can comment. Anyone can, can express facts as they are. This day we honor a magnificent man. A legendary fighter for the downtrodden. My pride and joy is to see the unchurched in church. Just stay. A saint in our lifetime. <laughs> Resilient, strong and nimble. But so are his enemies. This man killed my family. <laughs> Honorable commissioners, I protest. This is a well orchestrated campaign by my political enemies to destroy my reputation and political career. Over the last 10 years, during uh, the Kibaki uh, administration, we felt a sense of freedom. The system became more tolerant of divergent views, and we, were f we have been free as artists to express ourselves. In the recent past, Kenya has faced security challenges from hostile elements who are agents of the international terrorist networks. In his capacity as Commander-in-Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces, President Kibaki ordered a military campaign with a specific task to pursue elements of the Al-Shabaab militia who are increasingly launching attacks on Kenya, seriously damaging the country's standing that has cherished peaceful coexistence with its neighbors over the years. Kenya Defense Forces are now embedded with the African Union team that continues to secure several towns of Somalia, training the police and providing humanitarian assistance as order returns through efforts led by the Somali people themselves. Once we, 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 that country is stabilized by Amazon and the international uh, community, it should be possible to secure the countries in the region. The issue of you know, IEDs and, and grenades that are coming, coming all the way from Somalia will be a thing of the past. President Kibaki's administration is also undertaking reforms in the security sector, which will enhance the capacity of the country's security forces to provide swift and adequate services to the people. Kenyans now know how they want to be, to be governed. They want to be part and parcel of managing security. They may not manage certain specialized aspects, but in terms of defining their, their priorities in their, in their locations, down to the grassroots, Kenyans now want to, to get involved in the management of their security. On 12th December 2012, 10 years after assuming office, President Kibaki presided over his last Jamhuri Day celebrations as President of the Republic of Kenya. Kenya is now at the edge 
overtake off to greater prosperity, equity, and unity. We must keep our eyes on the goal of building a great Kenya for present and future generations. Soon after addressing the nation for the last time at the country's 49th Jamhuri Day celebrations, President Kibaki bid his parliamentary colleagues by. There were many nostalgic moments. Your Excellency led this house from the front to the enactment of the new constitution in the year 2010. In this regard and generally, I wish to acknowledge and appreciate the unfailing and continued support that I as the speaker and indeed the whole of the National Assembly have received from Your Excellency. President Kibaki and his wife, popularly known as Mama Lucy, are family people who've brought up a God-fearing, charming family of four with several grandchildren. Good values and love for one another are the cornerstones of their relationship. They have lovingly imparted these values to their offspring. We as a family, we thank the Almighty God for enabling you to give the best of yourself to Kenya and Kenyans for over 50 years. Thank you, Dad. President Kibaki is a man of faith. He regularly attends Mass where he takes time to seek inspiration and guidance for the immense tasks and responsibilities he shoulders. Kenya is a beautiful country. There are few countries in the world endowed with such a wealthy natural heritage. We are just beginning to understand how rich and blessed we are as a country. The president has been very supportive of higher education. And uh, this can be uh, seen from the, the way the number of uh, investors have increased since the president took over. Even when you make your own mistakes, which we often make as readers, he is very patient with you. For the time I've worked with him over the last 10 years, uh, Kibaki worked for the country. He listens a lot and comments in, uh, when need be. President Kibaki's presidency, presidency would go down in history as transformative uh, because he uh, gave us space to do work. The biggest impact he has had is to allow or to give room for the intellectualities, for professionalism to prevail. Everything must be put on the paper before you start thinking about execution. Hakuna kipande cha Kenya. Ambako hakuna maendeleo haya mazuri ambao yameendelea kule. Kwa sababu sisi lengo letu ni kutumikia kila mtu mahali alipo. 